This is chapter one. I had taken this trip so many times, it felt as if I should be collecting the tickets. I first rode the New York Central when they still had those elegant old trains like the Lakeshore and the 20th Century Limited. The train disappeared, and a moment later, light swept across the Hudson. It reemerged, gleaming, a silver ribbon speeding up the eastern bank of the river. I wasn't going to make this trip at all, but Alana, my ex-wife, insisted. She had badgered me all week until I agreed. Eamon, our son, was going to be in an equestrian event for handicapped kids in Chatham, New York near Hudson, 30 miles southeast of Albany. It had been 10 years and I still couldn't handle his disability and its worst symptom. It often began with a moan, followed by, oh no, but mostly it began in silence. Around three in the morning, the first spasm would begin and all I could do was hold him. I prayed to God and anyone I thought I knew in a heaven that didn't exist, or I'd coast at him, screaming, you motherfucker. But no one ever seemed to hear. I held Eamon and told him how much I loved him. With each jerk of his body, I tried to remind myself that this was not about me. It wasn't just the seizures that were so difficult, it was everything. The last time I had him as the door of my Stuyvesant Town apartment closed, he'd ripped off his pants to reveal that his underwear and thighs were smeared in his own shit. It took all my strength to hold him under the spray of the shower. He wasn't fond of forced cleanliness. Next came giving him an enema to avoid a repeat of the accident. There he sat on the toilet and unloaded, and I listened as he gleefully shouted, poopies. His forced laughter accompanied each splash, and I smiled for his sake, but I couldn't stand seeing him so debased. He barely spoke. There were some nouns, but hardly ever a verb, and he was 10 years old. He could never tell me when he was thinking, what he was thinking or feeling, the hardest part of caring for him. When nervous, he would place his hand below his nose and rapidly move it back and forth. The gesture evoked the state of a large injured crane moving its wings, yet unable to fly. He would never take flight, and I couldn't bear the energy expended on his behalf. In the end, he would still be severely handicapped, an injured bird ever flapping. He always carried a toddler's toy that made realistic farmyard sounds. With a pull on the cord, a plastic arrow would spin in a circle. Various animals were depicted on the circumference, and whatever animal the arrow pointed to would make a sound. The cow would moo, the pig oink, and the sheep baa. During his visits, all Eamon wanted was to play with his toy, but he couldn't pull the string himself. If he could, I would have put him in the bedroom, closed the door, and let him spin away. Instead, I was held captive weekend after weekend by endless hours of mooing, oinking, neighing, barking, meowing, and bleeding. Every time, I tr every time I tried to rest, he would plead with me and use one of his few verbs, spin. Just when I thought I would lose all control, when I thought I couldn't take another second, he would cross the room, loop his arm around my neck, and say, I love you, Daddy Jim. He would break my heart in two or three new places and allow me to go on. Alana picked me up at the Hudson Station and we drove through the rolling hills of Columbia County. I felt my usual apprehensions, but because I was only staying for a couple of hours, I didn't have to worry about being alone with Eamon for the entire weekend. I inhaled deeply when I saw him to steal myself. His handicaps took precedence over everything, and I would have to abandon my construction of the world and enter his reality of tedium and mindless repetition. By the time we arrived at the stables, he was already seated on a large black horse. He wore jodhpurs, a turtleneck, and a black velvet riding helmet. He looked handsome and relaxed, and his problems weren't easily detected up there. As I approached, he said, hi, Dad, 
who's here? He laughed and covered his mouth as if a strange creature might emerge. He waited a second, then repeated, hi, dad, who's here? I looked up and shouted, Eamon's here. He clapped his hands frantically as if to say, you should be really proud of me. It didn't matter that a guide was leading him around the ring. For the first time, I had something I could hold on to. It felt as if most of my life with him had been spent feeding him, cleaning him, giving him his enemas, or holding him while he flailed and convulsed. The few hours passed quickly. Alana and I were in no rush to let go of this feeling. We lingered and chatted about other things, her other children, our parents, work, and our latest loves, and how they were treating us. Eamon sat with us on a tiny mound at the edge of a field, pulling clumps of grass out of the ground and throwing them in the air. With each toss, he laughed and shouted, look what I did. I reached out and started pulling clumps of grass and tossed them up, imitating him. Look what I did. We laughed and laughed and repeated it till it was time to drive back to the Hudson train station. As I crossed the waiting room after buying my tickets, I heard, hey, Jim. The deep bass belonged to a guy named Jake, whom I knew from 12-step meetings in New York. When I turned, I saw Jake and a tall, striking woman standing in the middle of the small station. I couldn't take my eyes off her, and it felt as if the other 20 or so people in the station couldn't either. They all seemed to be either staring directly at her or sneaking sideways glances. She was tall and her legs were sheathed in skin-tight black ly lycra pedal pushers with large white polka dots. They clung to the contours of her finely muscled legs. Her rhinestone Mickey Mouse belt buckle and high-topped iridescent gold sneakers <laughs> made what should have looked lascivious appear whimsical. As Jake introduced us, she turned her head toward me. She wore one finely crafted silver and gold earring that dangled, dangled halfway down the right side of her long and supple neck. The introduction was clumsy. Jake said, Jim, this is Carly. He smiled in a somewhat mischievous way. I noticed that Alana, who was usually friendly and informal, acted a bit stiff. It took a moment for them to understand about Eamon. He seemed fairly normal until his echoing speech pattern gave him away. He quickly repeated, hi, how you doing? It made for an awkward moment until she grasped something of the situation. As the train to New York pulled into the station, she embraced Jake and nodded toward the three of us. Nice to meet you. Then she walked outside to board. I said goodbye to Alana, Jake, and Eamon and hurried through three or four cars looking for her. I found her in the last one perched in a four-seater with her long legs on the opposite cushion. She was reading and already seemed thoroughly engrossed. She looked up, hesitated, and a deep inviting alto said, would you like to sit down? The trees outside the train window colored her face with sunlight and shadow, and her azure eyes changed to green depending on the light. Her nose stretched wide, exotic, and cat-like. It would have been her face's most prominent feature had it not been for her mouth with its lush red lips. She held up the book she was reading, Catherine the Great by Henri Chorat. Perfect. I had taken a two-semester course at Siena in Russian history. <laughs> I thought I might, be, be, might impress her but as she stared at me, I could only think of Rasputin and the myth of Catherine and the horse. <laughs> I bit my tongue. Truth is, I don't remember too much about Russian history. It's the most romantic biography I've ever read. She launched into a short course on Catherine and her many lovers, including the story of a lady-in-waiting who tested Catherine's men to see if they measured up. She completed her precy with a description of Potemkin villages. They were facades, Hollywood sets that Potemkin erected along the Dnieper River to impress Catherine and her guests. Facades with nothing behind them. Jake says he knows you from the program. 
No one without my permission was supposed to tell anyone else. I told her as much, and she began to apologize profusely. Oh, Jake and I are best friends. We tell each other everything. He also said you're very eloquent and that you've helped a lot of people in recovery, and he, I forgave his indiscretions as I heard the compliments. <laughs> he had provided her with lots of info in the short time it had taken me to buy my ticket. He's in the program, very eloquent, helps a lot of people, and he's major, major, which was the phrase she would most remember. The train began to move. My son has a seizure disorder, infantile myoclonic seizures. Oh, I'm so sorry. What caused it? No one knows. It's an idiopathic diagnosis, which means the symptom describes the affliction. Eamon's image atop the horse and his jodhpurs and black velvet riding helmet powerfully lingered. A long stuck valve seemed to open, and I felt a rush of heat around my heart. I told the story carefully, including all the heart-wrenching details, holding him at six months old as he seized 50 times a day, holding him helplessly, knowing that each seizure inflicted more brain damage, never any answers, always just holding him and Eamon, unable to speak, walk, or even sit upright. Was that his mother I just met? Yes, my ex-wife, Alana. For the first 45 minutes, she barely got in a word. After Eamon, I went through the marriage's ending, including the description of my wife run, running off with a bagpiper. <laughs> <laughs> then I conducted a brief tour of my alcoholism and its effect on everything. It gave me an entrance into my family and my father's alcoholism and violence. When did you start drinking? 16 in the seminary. The seminary? I described a mysterious world, a place of rituals, rules, and solemn vows that no longer is, existed, a chimera that may have saved my life. I even shared that I had a bump below my kneecap from too much kneeling. <laughs> I, I lifted the right leg of my green Henry Lair slacks, the only designer item I owned, and showed her my knee. See? She smiled and I thought blushed a tiny bit. Everything tumbled easily forward. I sell insurance. Really? Yes, there are actually a lot of smart people in the insurance business. I'm also a writer. I'm trying to write a novel. William Kennedy is helping me. A layer of complexity. Throwing in Kennedy implied competence. <laughs> but I'm really a poet by nature. Then she asked another strange question. Except for your son, who is the person you love most in the world? The answer was so simple that I didn't need to pause. Alana, no one else comes close. What she has sacrificed for me is beyond understanding. She has given her life to me in a way that no one could ever have imagined. She welled up in the middle of my response. Oh God, I wish I had that with my ex-husband. Children? Two amazing children, but he will barely speak to me. I couldn't understand that. If you had my experience with Alana, you would know that anyone who had sacrificed so much for what was yours had to be loved. I had gone on a bit too long, so I changed course. What do you do? <laughs> I'm a singer. So is Alana. I've had, some I've had some success. So has Alana. She just released an album. Oh. I could see she needed some help. You have such unusual interests for a singer. History, literature, and even some philosophy. She laughed and then quickly explained, well, my father was in the book business. <laughs> I imagined a short man in a cloth apron covered with ink trying to fix a printing press. <laughs> I returned to something she might be proud of. What was the name of your album? Coming Around Again. Nice title. <laughs> I didn't actually think so. It, it, seemed, it seemed too cliched. What's your name? I mean your singing name. She froze and seemed to stammer. I could see she didn't want to tell me. Carly Simon. Those first 45 minutes were the only time we would ever be equals. And the, balance, and the balance vanished as the world moved in the opposite direction. Marsh marigolds blooming backward outside the window. 
It ended as I heard the name that would forever haunt me. I would often wish she had never told me or had made up a new one. I knew it was a famous name, but I didn't really know why. Should I know any of your songs? <laughs> My biggest hit is You're So Vain. I knew this song, but not really. Uh, I found that I had been unable, unable to listen to most popular music. I remembered the chorus, and I recalled standing in a bar in Troy, New York, thinking it made little sense. I think I've heard of it. Jerry Brown, James Taylor, Judy Collins, Linda Ronstadt, Warren Beatty, and Mick Jagger collided with, with each other in my mind in a confused attempt to help me figure out who this woman sitting across from me was. I didn't know, yet I knew she was a big deal. A strange instinct took over, and I wasn't going to let her talk. I wanted us to have a little bit more time with her thinking I didn't know. So I pulled the cord and let the arrow spin, oink, moo, meow, and bark. I just kept talking. I returned to the main topics of my life and filled in some details. I told a couple of zany stories about my father, the improbable tale of the founding of the Graymore Friars, the religious order of my seminary years, and finally my work with other alcoholics. In no time, we were passing the Otis Elevator Building in Yonkers, which meant the ride would soon end. From Yonkers to Grand Central, I obsessed about how to make my move. The train pulled into Grand Central Station, and I realized I had successfully kept the conversation from reverting to her. As we stood on the platform, she looked at me with a confused expression. You know, this has been a very unusual conversation for me. <laughs> Why is that? Usually, when I meet a man for the first time, we talk about me. I paused. I had blown it. But when I looked up, her lips were pulled together, suppressing a smile. I then uttered what it may have been the best sales line of my life. I was going to save that for the second date. <laughs> In the main waiting room of Grand Central Station, we stood for a moment and looked up at the constellations on the ceiling. As we stared at the heavens, I felt the direction of my life changing with a speed and force that rarely happens. I felt the direct, uh, we stood under the dimly painted stars of the zodiac and thought we could make out Cancer and Orion, but we weren't sure. Shafts of bright light poured down through the high clerestory windows and kept illuminating us as we crossed the station. I stopped as we were about to exit onto 42nd Street and said, oh, I don't have your number. It's Jim Crab. What? Jim Crab. I always form words to remember numbers by. Just dial Jim Crab. <laughs> These two simple words were about to change everything. After all the years of struggle, pain, and expectation, it was going to be this random, Jim Crab. So, I'm almost there. So anyway, just to give you a sense, because I'm moving so rapidly towards the end. Um, so the book goes through my entire life, flashbacks and so on, uh, from my childhood and, and, um, and the seminary years and the death of a great friend in the seminary and, and a whole, and, and then my life with Alana and Eamon and so on. And, and then Carly and I are married for 20, six months after this event, Carly and I were married. And uh, we embarked on a spectacular, wonderful, romantic, 20-year, crazy, challenging, fabulous life together. And I'm sober 21 years at that point, and I have a bit of a relapse. And. And this is the relapse. I haven't read this ever to anyone, so but I thought I'd give it a try here, this sophisticated Albany crowd. <laughs> so my crack dealer is, is, has come into my apartment, and, uh, and here we go. 
After a couple more hits, I traveled from the universe of my pain to a doorway of hazy bliss. It was as if Our Lady of the Atonement, the woman who had first inspired my childhood dreams, had finally appeared to me in her raiment of burgundy and blue. Her golden tiara glistened through a cloud of yellow smoke. My father beat me, but there was no pain. And when he used that terrible phrase, we laughed knowingly together. My long forgotten novel became a bestseller. And most importantly, Eamon never had his first seizure. There was a twinge in my right thumb from striking the wheel of the lighter. I had smoked about $800 worth of crack in the past two days. I didn't smoke it by myself. I was a generous host. And there was never a shortage of visitors once they heard the phrase, I've got enough. I felt especially generous since I had learned how to shotgun using a condom. I would take a hit, hold it as long as possible, hold the rubber ring right against my mouth, and exhale into it. The condom expanded like a balloon, and I would then squeeze the opening shut to capture the smoke. Then take a breath or two, pause, put the condom to my lips again, and drag the smoke back into my lungs to get a double hit from one drag. In the last few months, most of my hits were double hits. Sometimes I could get a third with the, with the same cloud of smoke. The first time Spike used my bathroom, his assessment of me changed. Hey man, you teach at Harvard? One of my awards for excellence in teaching hung in the bathroom wall over the toilet. <laughs> yes, I did. Cool. I wanted Spike's admiration, perhaps to be his only famous addict. I wanted the kind of special treatment I had so often seen given to those around me, a look in, in his eyes of unwarranted admiration. Yet he was not about to cross my normal, any normal boundaries. Early on, I offered him a hit from my pipe, and he let me know I don't play that way. He said he, said he had never smoked crack in his life. As I thought about that odd fact, I took another hit held it as long as I could, and blew another large, acrid, yellow cloud above him toward the ceiling. The smoke filled my apartment night and day, and I never understood why the people on my floor didn't notice it. It had a distinctly sweet and pungent aroma, like a burning plastic bag filled with sugar. The odor lingered for days. What do I owe you? 400. There were four bags, there were four bags over the usual amount, so it was going to be a good couple of days. I didn't know that this was going to be my last run. I handed Spike the thick wad of 20s, hoping he would leave quickly. I wanted to get fucked up right away before too much paranoia sent, set in. And I knew I didn't have too wide a window. The space between perfection and extreme paranoia was getting smaller and smaller. He checked his pockets one more time and then left. I located a non-lubricated condom and in no time I was flying. I would need to pull back, pull back a bit. It was too early in the day to be this torped. So I stopped and pulled all my cleaning supplies from under the kitchen sink. I was going to expunge the filth, make the world sparkle like an old Mr. Clean commercial. I tried just about every kind of cleanser I could find. In the end, I decided I would have to scrape each piece of dirt out by hand. I used paint scrapers, brillo pads, screwdrivers, knives, and coat hangers to dig into the wood's filthy cracks. I never try, tired of trying new implements. The stains had to go. I saw it as my most urgent per and perhaps final task, a quest that I had to complete before the end of things. And while I scraped, the hours flew by. Night descended over 97th Street, and I found myself crouched in the darkness, no longer scrubbing, but hiding beneath the windowsill so they couldn't see me. They wouldn't be able to detect my, detect my movements if I stayed low. I peeked between the slats and noticed that the street lights on West 97th Street were surrounded by undulating halos. I had noticed many strange events over the past months, but these glowing, pulsating lights made a strong impression. It made me think I might have a chance, that they might not get me. I became distracted as I noticed men and women, friends of mine, dancing in midair outside my second floor window. 
I knew it wasn't likely, yet there they were, laughing, gyrating, and waving. A flapper stood in the alley outside the window on the back stairway. Uh, every time I went down the stairs, she waited, le leaning against a small tree. She waved to me and always oddly sang the same Edith Piaf song, Non je ne regret rien. I al always hummed along and waved back. Tonight, though, there was a new voice, and I fell to the ground as I heard it. He stood just at my door asking, where's dad? Where's dad? This wasn't possible. Eamon lived hours away outside Albany. He couldn't possibly out be outside my door. Given his many handicaps, the people dancing in midair were more likely to be there than he was. Yet I keep he kept hearing him wondering loudly, where's dad? Where's dad? I ran into the bathroom where I had another pipe and locked the door behind me. I placed a gorilla hit onto the wire screen. It crackled in, as the flame melted it against the wire. As I exhaled, I felt a rush of relief, and then a spurt of familiar pleasure, and then the sound of his voice went away. The bathroom was the safest place. It had no windows, so I couldn't be seen. Also, it had a vent, so the pungent smell was more difficult to detect. I could break the crack pipe and flush it before the police knocked down the door to my apartment. I stacked furniture against the front door whenever I was in the apartment and leveraged it against the opposite wall. This would give me this would, give me, uh, this would give me time to get rid of everything before the SWAT team broke in. Why hadn't they busted me? They just kept talking in the hallway, and I heard every word they said. Their walkie-talkies blasted, their voices intermingled with the piercing static. A man urgently whispered, get him, get him now. Then a female voice with a Bronx or Brooklyn accent who had the ultimate authority responded, no. Don't fuck this up like the last time. Don't move. Nobody moves until I say so. I returned to my couch and took a few more hits. I was delighted by the motion as the floor, as the flame of my bick performed its dance against the front of the pipe. It kissed the screen gently as I inhaled from the other end. I felt safe again. Lord, let me never be confounded. I was safe on the subway, but walking the short distance from 97th Street to 96 was a challenge. After I made it through the turnstiles at the 96th Street station, I could relax. I felt invulnerable there. I carried my drugs and glassware in the six pockets of my cargo pants. I didn't stay underground long. I usually surfed in, surfaced in Chelsea and quickly faced the bricks of one old factory building or another. I would light up, take a massive hit, blow a huge cloud of smoke, and presume that no one knew what I was doing. I thought I couldn't be seen. The narcs from the Upper West Side wouldn't know where I'd gone. After an hour, I'd head back, back uptown, passing them as they sped downtown in the opposite direction. The subway was my first conscious memory, my father and I riding on an elevated train above the city. The buildings below were tiny and insignificant, my father's delight was infectious. He wore a long blue winter dress coat and, and fedora and held me tightly in his arms. He carefully placed me on the rattan seat and roared with laughter. Other people in the car were dressed in pastel shades. They never smoked, they just smiled and gestured. The elevated car would suddenly jerk, then saw upward and without warning plummet. Minutes later, he picked me up and held me close to him. Surely I would never come to harm. As I waited for the uptown train, I remember how he looked standing on the platform, his body draped over the chiclet machine. It was hard to tell whether he was about to dance or start a fight. He leaned against the metal columns which displayed his taut muscular body and then stretched his arms high above, above him, a celebrant in an esoteric ritual only performed in this subterranean world. He looked like the high priest of the IRT. How I wish he could caress me now and give me his blessing. But he was deep in the throes of late stage Alzheimer's. He knew less about where, where he was than I did. As I emerged from my reverie, it struck me without warning that I had to stop. As if the vision of my father's compelling masculinity was reaching out and telling me that if I didn't stop now, I might never get another chance. When I arrived home, I dropped a dime on myself. 
I called a close friend in recovery. As soon as he answered, I told him I had been on crack for months. There was a long silence. Really? Really? Who's going to tell you, Carly, you or me? I will. Okay, call me right back. I opened the blinds on one of the front windows, inhaled deeply, and let the smoke fill the room. The halo still flickered around the street lights, and I took this to be a sign of rescue. I sat on the floor what? a while and tried to figure out what I was going to say. I dialed and she picked up on the first ring. As I heard her voice, I knew everything would be okay. Her deep, rich alto soothed me. The sound of it always affirmed me, made me feel safer and closer to her than anyone I had ever known. She intoned my name, Jimmy Hart, as if it were a hosanna, an exultation, as if she were naming me for the very first time, each and every time. In that moment, I had no doubt about her love for me. So my dear friend Carl and my wife Carly decided that I should go to McLean Psychiatric Hospital. I agreed, took a couple of Xanax, and was soon filled with a rapturous joy, knowing that no matter what happened, I had a wife and friend who loved me. I had done it again, so filled with the arrogance of one who had risked everything and survived, I felt engulfed by the godlike wisdom of my experience. I had thrown it all up in the air, and now it fell. No one could assail my courage in the line of fire. I had survived a second time, re-engaged in a battle that kills so many. Perhaps I was even more daring than my father. Maybe that's all I needed to prove, that I could be as reckless and brave as he had been. As the Xanax took over, I contemplated the wonder of what I had seen, what I had become. I threw the leftover pieces of rock into the toilet and flushed them away. I was glad that my father didn't know what had happened because it would have broken his heart, a small gift of Alzheimer's. In no time, I was off to McLean's in Belmont, Massachusetts. The material my new shrink wanted to talk about surprised me. It wasn't my father, Eamon, Carly, fame, failure, addiction, or sex. He wanted to spend most of our time investigating my many secrets, my many secret lives and their origin. Little did I know how long ago the secrets had begun or how deeply some of, some of them were buried. Thank you.